Good afternoon and welcome to this seminar, which is the last one in the series of sales lunchtime seminars. This term, it gives me great pleasure to welcome our speaker today, Professor Pablo Ibanez Coloba, who is a professor of law at the London School of Economics and also a visiting professor at the College of Europe in Bruges. I think for those of us who work in the field of competition law, he's someone that needs no introduction. Um, because as you all would know, his work has been hugely influential in shaping the direction of debate in competition law in a number of very key issues. And um, I should say, if I'm allowed a bit of a personal perspective that there are two aspects of um, Professor Ivanet Coloma's work that have, I have always admired in particular, and those are the following. The first one, um, it has been the fact that he has never been afraid to contest what I would call the accepted um, wisdom in competition law. He has never been afraid to suggest how competition law could do things better. And I think on the second aspect that I've always admired in his work is the fact that in an era where scholarship has become so increasingly specialized, he's someone who has been able to cover with the same kind of depth and clarity of understanding a huge number of issues, which are very different in the field of competition law. From the economics of competition law, to the relationship between competition and regulation, to state aid, to the direction of Article 102, to the digital economy. I think that's a very remarkable ability and one that not everyone has. And something, as I say, that I think is particularly uh, important in his work. Now, today he's going to talk to us about something that, a topic that I think is incredibly interesting, judicial review in competition law, something that I think has been neglected. And I'm so looking forward to hearing what he has to say about this subject. So I'm going to stop talking and leave the floor to him so you can all listen to what he has to say. I think he's going to speak for 40 minutes or so, and then there will be some time for questions. So thank you very much and welcome, Pablo. Thank you very much, Albertina, for this very kind introduction. And thank you very much for the invitation to this cell series. I have admired the activities of the center for many, many years. I have followed the weekly seminars um, well since I started at LSE so it's a true honor to be here sharing my thoughts with you today uh, virtually um, and in person. So then the topic I chose as you were saying is a fairly traditional one but it is one that I chose deliberately because I wanted to stay in keeping with the tradition of the activities of the center. As you were mentioning I didn't want to do anything that would be overly specialized. I would rather engage in a topic that would be of interest also for uh, non-competition lawyers and that will allow for a fruitful conversation following my presentation. Right? And as we were discussing, Albertina, you will remember over lunch, I've always been of the impression that competition law has a great deal to offer to specialists in other fields, whether in EU law or elsewhere, and my hope is that this discussion, which is focused on judicial review, will allow uh, for that conversation to happen. Right? So then, um, in many ways, I am looking forward to getting more as I hopefully will be. So then this slide is the one that captures the essence or the main point of my presentation, which is the relationship between, as you see, law, policy and expertise. And I think to this audience, I don't think I need to explain at any length why um, these three areas are very closely intertwined. And I think it's very difficult to think of the law without thinking of policy. I think the law influences the way in which policy is shaped and vice versa in the same way that expertise also uh, informs both law and policy making activities, right? Then, because these areas are so closely intertwined, well, there's a number of issues that arise every now and then at the intersection of these three matters. So then one question in which I've always been interested, just to give you a flavor of the sort of questions that I want to address. Well, is an administrative authority like the European Commission free to choose the expertise on which it relies? In other words, is the choice of the expertise a matter of discretion of the authority? 
in the same vein, well, is an administrative authority under a duty to rely on the best available evidence or is a failure to rely on the best available evidence something that will justify the annulment of a commission decision? Another question on which I will elaborate further today concerns the standards of, the, of review, right? So then if there are different standards of review in relation to each of these three areas, how do they re relate to one another? And how does the difference in terms of standards of review play out in practice in concrete terms, right? So this is the general um, spirit of my project, which will hopefully turn into an article later on. In the minutes that will follow, I will focus in particular on the relationship between law and policy. And I don't think I uncover anything new when I say that law and policy are by definition very closely related. One cannot be understood without the other. And this is so in a number of ways. I think the most obvious one is that policy in a field like EU competition law is by definition implemented through law. In other words, the law constraints, the manner in which policy is construed and implemented. And the law will act as a limit as to uh, how far policy can go. Right? So then in the interest of a general discussion, just to give you a flavor for those non-specialists who might be following, I will mention a couple of very obvious examples. So when it comes to the application of Article 101, so the one provision that deals with agreements, well, it is necessary in order to implement policy to show in the first place that there's some form of explicit coordination between independent firms. Absent evidence of explicit coordination, Article 101 and the underlying policy will not be implemented. When it comes to Article 102, well, same thing. It would be necessary to show that an independent firm enjoys a dominant position within the meaning of that provision. And this inevitably acts as a constraint on policy making. So those are general issues, the interdependence between law and policy and the fact that policy has to be implemented through law. And this relationship, as you see in the slide, gets problematic, potentially tricky when judicial review is at stake. And I think it makes sense to elaborate that um, a bit further. So then when it comes to policy making, an administrative authority will by definition enjoy discretion. And I would say that it cannot be otherwise. So then an administrative authority has limited resources. There's only so many cases that it can take. And it follows from that fact that it should have leeway, ample leeway, to decide how it makes use of its limited resources. That means that, for instance, when it comes to the application of Articles 101 and 102, firms are not entitled to a decision stating that their practice is not in breach of one of those provisions. This is something to which firms are not entitled. In the same way that a firm is not entitled to compel an administrative authority like the European Commission to start an investigation. And this is natural, and I think this is uh, inherent in, in administrative law. Then, from that perspective, I think it also follows that judicial review of those choices, of choices relating to the use of an authority of its limited resources, will also be subject to limited review. And to the extent that those choices are subject to judicial review, judicial review would be limited in nature. It will be confined to what we call marginal er uh, 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 manifest errors of assessment. Right? And so far, so good. The problem comes when we consider the standard of review of issues of law. So then if the assessment of policy choices is subject to marginal review, is only controlled for manifest errors of assessments, issues of law, on the other hand, are subject to full review by the EU courts. So that means in concrete terms, it's quite interesting um, to discuss this in the UK, that it is not sufficient that the interpretation of the legal provision by the authority is a reasonable one. 
it has to be the correct one. And it is for the court, not for the administrative authority, to decide the correct interpretation of the relevant legal provision. And I would say it is also in the nature of things. Then full judicial review I think is particularly necessary in instances or in systems like the EU one, where you have an authority like the Commission, which is in charge of both investigating and deciding matters. So it's a corrective mechanism. It seems necessary to rely on courts that are entitled to fully review issues of law and whose interpretation of the law will be the one that will be the authoritative one without leaving any discretion on matters of law to the authority. But of course, you can imagine that precisely because of this close intertwinement, the exercise of full review can be an issue. Right? If a decision is annulled because it relies on an incorrect interpretation of the law, policy may suffer as a result. So formally speaking, the decision may only touch upon an issue of law and the decision may simply state, well, Article 101 or Article 102 has been incorrectly interpreted in this particular instance, therefore the decision is annulled. But the impact on policy can be very substantial. It can make policy less effective. It can make policy less far reaching or it can question policy altogether. There is a chance that if the interpretation of the European Commission in a particular instance is found to be incorrect, the premises on which policy is based fall apart and therefore a complete area of policy is made unworkable. And we can discuss some examples um, in that regard later on um, if you want. Then this means that courts in the EU system will be navigating a very fine line when reviewing administrative action. On the one hand, they would have to be respectful of the policy choices of the authority, and they would have to be respectful not to interfere with those policy choices. On the other hand, they would have to exercise full review when it comes to issues of law. And it is in the navigation of this fine line um, that I'm interested in, and of which this presentation is a manifestation. It's interesting in a number of ways. I think there's ramifications into the question. What I would be interested in here, in particular, today has to do with the need for the courts to avoid the cross-contamination of standards of review. Then when it comes to policy choices, the standard of review would be one of marginal review, would be one of control for mar and, and manifest errors of assessment. When it comes to issues of law, it would be full review. And then the challenge for the court is to ensure that there's full review where it is due without interfering with policy choices and vice versa, making sure that the leeway that the commission needs and has in relation to policy choices does not translate in limited review when it comes to issues of law. Right. Um, that's my um, interest, and this is what I will be discussing in the coming few um, minutes. Right. So then what I propose to do is to touch upon some of the techniques that the court has developed over the years in order to ensure that full review is exercised when it comes to issues of law and that this full review is compatible with the difference that an authority like the European Commission is entitled to when it comes to policy making, right? So then in other words, the conundrum that I raise here in this slide as a question, making sure that review is effective without questioning policy choices. And in that regard, I thought I would articulate in the coming minutes around what I call the hallmarks of effective judicial review. So these are some of the techniques I have identified in the case law that ensure that issues of law are fully controlled. Right? You have five of them that I hope to discuss at length in a paper, I will only be addressing some of them in the interest of time and in the interest of the discussion that I will also hope to have with you. Then when it comes to the first, you will see in the slide that the one conclusion I draw from the case law, so it would be a matter of positive law, is that policy 
if it's to be implemented, it will have to be implemented by means of clear legal criteria that can be on the one hand anticipated and subject to meaningful judicial review. Right? So this may sound a bit esoteric, but I will try to elaborate um, on the point to make it more um, concrete. So then the one point that I draw from an analysis of the case law is that unstructured legal texts are not amenable to full judicial review. And for that same reason, whenever the interpretation of the law by the European Commission is based on one of these unstructured legal tests, it is very likely to be annulled. In other words, courts will not upheld, uphold tests that amount in effect to give or to give in discretion to the administrative authority, right? There has to be a clear divide between law and policy, as we were saying, and this divide between law and policy has to be translated in the way in which the law is interpreted and in the way in which legal tests in particular are developed. Whenever a legal test amounts in effect, if not the jure, to giving discretion to the authority, that test will be annulled. Right? So then I think it makes sense that I elaborate a, a bit on this and I will do so by reference to a relatively recent case decided a couple of years ago. So this can get very technical, but what really matters is the point of principle on which I will hope we will have a discussion. Then this was an invitation to the general court to interpret for the first time a new legal provision. Then the test for the assessment of mergers changed in 2004. So then the legality of merger no longer dependent on a finding of a dominant position was no longer contingent on the merger creating or strengthening a dominant position. The test was broadened so as to encompass uh, transactions that would give rise to a significant impediment to effective competition. So then following this uh, modification, following the, the adoption of the new regulation, there were some easy cases that were not giving rise to legal interpretation issues those transactions in which the merger would lead to the creation of the strengthening of a dominant position, but there was a gap in the law when transactions giving rise to a significant impediment to effective competition without creating or strengthening dominance were at stake. And it is in this CK Telecom's case that the general court had the chance for the first time to interpret this provision. So then leaving technicalities aside, what really matters from my perspective is the finding of the general court. So then the European Commission had interpreted um, this question in the absence of any case law precedence and the commission's interpretation was found to be erroneous by the general court. And why is that? Well, hopefully this slide captures the essence of the general court's argument. The general courts realized that if the commission's interpretation of the law had been upheld, then any, and I emphasize any, horizontal merger would have been deemed to give rise to a significant impediment to effective competition. So in effect, even if it's not formally the case, in effect, this interpretation of the law would have given the European Commission the discretion to decide which horizontal mergers to allow and which to prohibit. And as you see from this crucial passage of the judgment, the general court uh, concluded that this interpretation was incorrect, they, that the commission had conflated a number of concepts and that by conflating these concepts, it had construed the law in such a way that would, blur the, that would have blurred the line between law and discretion. Then a new test would have to be implemented. And this is exactly the gap that was filled and you see at the bottom of the slide that was construed. And as you see from this example, the general court sought to draw a clear divide between law and policy. 
he said, well, if we're going to interpret the law in this particular area, well, there's a gap. There has to be, or the law has to be interpreted in a way that would allow firms to anticipate and that would set two conditions that can be meaningfully reviewed by court. He said, well, instead of construing the law in a way that gives discretion, we would set out two criteria that the European Commission would have to show in any given case uh, in order to show that there is a significant impediment to effective competition, even though the transaction doesn't lead to the creation or the strengthening of a dominant position. Right? So then that's one of the hallmarks of judicial review that I find interesting. So this is a relatively recent example, but we can discuss other examples, I think, all the way back to 91, if we think of the old Axel ruling, we see this same concern on the part um, of the courts in, in the EU in favor of structural legal tests that can be meaningfully reviewed by court and against those tests that would de facto amount to granting discretion. That's one point. Then let me move to a second hallmark uh, of effective judicial review, as I called it in this presentation. This is an interesting and potentially controversial. I would claim that the law as interpreted by the EU courts is clear in that law and policy would have to be grounded on the expert consensus. And I think this is a crucial matter, and I dare to say even relevant beyond the specific context of um, EU competition. What is the importance um, of this matter? Well, let's suppose that we give an authority the discretion to choose the expertise on which it relies. In other words, that we will give an authority the discretion to decide whether to rely on the mainstream consensus or whether to rely on heterodox or informal issues instead. Well, the implications for the, from the perspective of judicial review would be very significant in theory and in practice. If discretion extended to the choice of the expertise on which it would rely, well, by definition, judicial review would be affected and therefore um, the interference or the standard of the review and the circumstances in which courts would interfere with administrative action would inevitably be affected as a result. And by the same token, in effect, the authority would have greater discretion when interpreting the law. So potentially, this extending discretion to the expertise would potentially be in conflict with the idea that um, issues of law are subject to full review by the EU courts. And I would say this question is particularly relevant in a subject like competition law, where expertise and reliance on expertise is inevitable. Right? So then we, have, we sometimes see discussions about whether or how much to rely on economic analysis in competition law. But I would say that's a false debate, right? So then the real debate in competition law is whether to rely on formal mainstream economics or whether instead to rely on informal, intuitive or heterodox economics, right? But economic analysis, in other words, expertise cannot be avoided, right? So the real question is whether to rely on formal economics that draws from the expert consensus or whether to accept uh, that the authority can rely on heterodox or informal intuitive economics instead. Right? And on these points, my impression from a close reading of the case law is again, that discretion does not extend to expertise. Right? So then a clear limit to administrative action is expertise and the um, EU courts will not accept reliance on non-mainstream issues. So in that sense, it's a limit as to how far policy making can go. So I was using a recent example. I thought I would now choose a relatively old one, right? And dating back to 93. And just to illustrate, um, I guess, this point. And the key point here is that the court relied on expertise and said, well, when it comes to proving that there has been explicit collusion between um, independent firms, 
it is not sufficient to show that they behave in the same way on the market. Something more would have to be established in order to show that there is an agreement or a concerted practice within the meaning of Article 101. And the crucial point here is not the details, but the fact that this claim made by the court draws directly from the mainstream consensus. The mainstream consensus had long been consistent in saying the fact that two or more independent firms behave in the same way on the market is in itself insufficient to conclude that there is explicit coordination between them. As a result, if administrative actions take place, if an administrative authority is to rely on Article 101 to intervene, it will have to show either that there is explicit coordination or that the only plausible explanation for the common course of conduct is explicit coordination. And that means that the scope of application of Article 101 and the scope of policy making is also reduced as a result. And in fact, the European Commission has failed to meet this threshold in a number of cases. Well, Woodpout 2 being one, CISAC is another one um, that comes to mind. Right? So this is one example. I think others that have followed over the years, one of my favorite ones being Ertur's again, the notion of tacit collusion and therefore the notion of collective dominance within the meaning of the merger regulation would have to be interpreted in line in light of the mainstream consensus. The European Commission would not be free to decide um, the notion of collective dominance, ignoring the expert consensus that defines the instances in which a tacit collusion is to arise. And I think, well, this example of Woodpulp 2 dates back to the days when I was even myself in primary school, but I think I can also rely on other more recent examples. Right? And then CK Telecoms, the one case I cited before, is one of them, and I think provides a number of examples from how the expert consensus was relied upon to question some aspects of the analysis of the Commission. But I can also uh, mention an example from a judgment of this very year, the Intel judgment, where if you consider the factors that were identified by the general court when it comes to a reviewing administrative action, these factors are directly drawn from um, the mainstream consensus, which identifies the instances in which some practices are likely to give rise to anti-competitive effects. So from that perspective, I think there's some consistent approach on the part of the court. Right? And a consistent approach and an interesting debate that I think is likely to uh, become even more intense in the coming years, right? So then I don't think I discover anything new when I say that digital markets have become a policy priority uh, at the EU level, but also at the national level and elsewhere, including the UK. And what's interesting about this debate is that some of the claims that are made about digital markets that might be relied upon to justify more active policy making are not necessarily part of the consensus or is a level of expertise that has not been sufficiently tested. And if that's the case, well, the question will inevitably arise of whether in relation to digital markets, intervention can take place, even though it is at odds with the expert consensus, or even though there is no expert consensus on some of the claims that are made about the function of digital markets. Right. This is something, an area to watch that we can discuss perhaps uh, later on. Right. So this is for the second hallmark. Then let me move now to the third one, which has to do with the way in which an authority like the Commission uh, behaves over time. And if there's one conclusion that we can draw in this regard, is that the EU courts expect an authority like the Commission to be consistent with the commitments it makes, right? So then in other words, we would expect the European Commission to keep its word over time and to behave in a manner that is consistent with the promises that it makes at a given point in time. I think for those of you who are not competition lawyers and for those of you in particular who are administrative lawyers, this may come as a natural conclusion, right? So this is something that would be consistent with the principle of good administration and with, I think, other more general principles of law, such as the principle of legitimate expectations, right? So then if an authority 
has created the legitimate expectation that it will behave in a particular way, well, it's natural for um, stakeholders to expect that this promise will be kept, right? And here, the example I draw comes again from this year's judgment in Intel. And this case and other cases, including Google Shopping and the opinion of Advocate General Randos in the Servizio Electrico case, were discussed because the guidance paper, a soft law instrument issued by the European Commission, had been cited every now and then. So then first came the opinion of Advocate General Randos in Servizio Electrico and some reactions that we saw is saying, well, it is strange that an advocate general would cite um, a soft law instrument, a policy document of an administrative authority uh, in its interpretation or his interpretation of the law. The same comment came when both Google Shopping and Intel came out. And these two are judgments from the general court. And people would say, well, it is notable that the general court would refer to a policy document of the European Commission when interpreting the law. Well, it is first a policy document, and it's a policy document that was never intended to state what the law is. And then why, how can we explain the relatively extensive reliance on a policy document that was never intended to state what the law is? Again, it goes back to the points that I was making. Here we see that on the one hand, the general court is saying the decision must be annulled because it failed to consider one aspect that the expert consensus would suggest is necessary to establish an infringement. Say, so, well, a practice of this nature can only be prohibited when it is shown that it has a sufficient coverage, is one of the factors that the expert consensus would suggest is necessary before taking action. That, as you see, the general court didn't stop there. It went on and say, the commission itself, in its policy document, had committed to evaluating this factor when prioritizing cases. So once the administrative authority had promised to prioritize cases in accordance with this factor, it cannot ignore this factor when deciding a case. At the very least, the administrative authority would have to explain why, in a particular case, it has failed to consider this factor or why, in a particular case, this factor is not relevant. What uh, one takeaway from this judgment is that the administrative authority could not simply ignore the factor without giving appropriate reasons as to why. Right, so that's third hold my Yes, you want? Yeah. So just on this point, is that, is that not confusing two things though? So one is why are you bringing in the case? And the second is how are you deciding the case? And is that not conflating? You have to take into account why you're bringing in the case when you are deciding or in determining how to decide the case. So if it's just an enforcement priority, so this is how I've committed myself to bring in cases that meet these criteria. Yeah. And so that appears to say, can't bring a case that doesn't meet this criteria. But if I can bring the case, even if it doesn't meet that criteria, how is that criteria relevant to how I then have to decide the case? Well, no, that's, that's a great point. I think it's, it's, and it's good that we have this conversation, right? So then I guess the point is, when it comes to judicial review, the question is what would happen if um, the administrative authority would behave in a manner that is inconsistent with its promise? Would that entail the annulment of the decision? To which my answer is yes, and that's the point. That's, that's the key issue. So then you're, you're simply saying, and it's a matter of policy making, but it has implications when it comes to judicial review and when it comes to the legality of the decision. So then the conclusion I draw here, clearly, and I think, and it's not the only example anyway, I think we can discuss also, I mean, the de minimis notice is an interesting example, and I think it's the most obvious parallel. Again, it's a policy document. It's, without going into the details, is another document in which the European Commission sought to give an interpretation to a legal doctrine uh, developed by the courts. And in a, another case, I think it's a good example, Expedia, the 
court would say this is not binding on national courts or national authorities, but to the extent that the commission has made a promise to apply this legal concept in accordance with this set of criteria, it would be binding on the commission itself. So then I guess to answer your question is, well, if the commission were to decide a case in a manner inconsistent with this notice, uh, without explaining why it is departing from the notice in detail, I think this would introduce by definition entail the annulment of the decision. And this is the one point uh, that I will um, elaborate upon. Okay, good, that, that's a great point. I think, and you see how it is separate from the issue of law itself and how it is relied upon to reinforce the point. I think if I had more time, I would also perhaps develop a bit on the relationship between policy and expertise, because it's quite interesting um, as well. Right, so that's the third hallmark, and thank you um, for the great question. And I will bring an end to my presentation with another hallmark, which I think is a way, in a way, an all-encompassing one, and I can summarize it as follows. Well, the relevant economic and legal realities would have to be considered. In other words, the EU courts, when they exercise judicial review, are not satisfied with relatively abstract hypothetical assessments. And this is true across the board. And this is something that has become apparent in the past few years. And it has become apparent across the board. And I think it has a number of implications. So generally speaking, I think when it comes to the interpretation of the law itself, I think the overarching claim I would make is that the decision of whether or not a practice amounts to an infringement is a context specific exercise. Right. So this is not something that can be decided in the abstract. And there was some confusion in some areas. Right? So then one area that I've, I've discussed a number of times with some of you, for instance, the question of whether an agreement has as its object the restriction of competition. Well, there was some confusion, but I think if there's something I can confidently say after the case of the past few years is that even deciding whether the object of a practice is restrictive that's a context-specific exercise. It doesn't follow, of course, that we need to assess the effects, but we cannot reach a conclusion about the object of an agreement without looking at the relevant context. When it comes to the effect assessment of the anti-competitive effects of a practice in relation to other practices that would only be prohibited when they're likely to have anti-competitive effects, again, this is a context-specific exercise. And so that's when it comes to the law itself, that a number of conclusions follow beyond the content um, of the law itself, right? So then one conclusion that is quite interesting and we'll discuss later is the second bullet that you have here. So whenever a firm is able to provide evidence, casting doubts on the premises on which administrative action is based, this has implications uh, for the tasks uh, of the administrative authority. And by the same token, a failure to take seriously evidence in that sense will have consequences for the legality of the decision. In that sense, if there's a conclusion we can draw from the most recent case law is that whenever there's evidence that is capable of casting doubts on some of the conclusions of or on which a decision is based, this evidence will have to be taken seriously. Uh, this became particularly apparent in one of the iterations of this Intel saga to which I was referring, but it is by no means the only one. Right? And if we think of Article 101, the Murphy case, again, a similar point was made by the court in that case. If the parties to an agreement are capable of providing evidence, casting doubts on the capability of an agreement to restrict competition, well, this will lead to, or this might lead to the conclusion that there's no infringement of Article 101, even when the agreement would be, by its very nature, prohibited. Right? And that's also relevant when it comes to the assessment of the anti-competitive effects um, of agreements. Right? So then some classics in which arguments pertaining to the relevant economic legal context led to the annulment of a decision are cases in which the so-called counterfactual was at stake. If you think of cases like O2, et cetera, again, 
the parties were able to provide arguments showing, well, in light of the counterfactual, it would appear that this agreement is not restrictive of competition. And again, in light of those arguments, um, the decision was an old why, because those arguments were not taken sufficiently seriously. And in many of the instances, simply the European Commission failed to incorporate those arguments in the analysis and failed to assess the extent to which the premises on which the decision was based were questioned by such arguments, right? I think it's a good idea to leave it there. Thank you very much again, uh, Albertina, um, for, the, um, for hosting me and having me here today. I very much look forward to the questions we can have in the coming 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you.